Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MIF Plus Plus seminar. It's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague Andras Alpers from the Department of Mathematical Sciences in the University of Liverpool, UK, who recently got a research grant and will talk about optimal diagram representations of polycrystalline microstructures. Over to you, Andras. Yeah, thank you very much, Vitaly, for inviting me. Uh, this is already my second talk in your seminar. The last one was, I think, two years ago about some super pixels. And I, I plan also at the very end to come a little bit to that topic, actually, again, with these super pixels. Um, but as I understand, um, well, I, I would like to give you more or less a general overview of some, uh, some, some of these aspects. Uh, I mean, so the title is maybe a bit scary uh, about these optimal diagram representations. Uh, I, I want to, uh, well, I mean, I, I would like to explain what this is about, um, not going too much into the details. Um, I have a few uh, slides too much. It's not 100 slides, um, but um, I'll skip uh, uh, over some of them. Um, and uh, well, and I think there will be, yeah, my, my talk is around 15 minutes. And if you have questions, even in between, please, um, please feel free to ask questions. I'm very happy to answer answer them. Um, what what I want to talk, yes, so this is this uh, cryptic title, optimum, Optimal Diagram Representations of Polycrystalline Microstructures. Um, so it's about modeling and representing um, yeah, polycrystalline microstructures. Um, part of this work is joint uh, work with uh, Peter Gritzmann uh, uh, and uh, Max Fiedler and Fabian Klemm from the Technical University of Munich. Uh, with whom I have their two joint papers on this uh, subject. And as Vitaly mentioned, uh, the EPSRC grant, uh, which I'm currently, which currently started that project, um, is also related to this. And some of my students are also, uh, I hope uh, <laughs> some of them are present. Um, and they're also working on some of these aspects. Of course, I'm, uh, yeah, so, so I just want to give more or less an, an, a small, well, a short overview in a sense. Uh, well, it's still, still 50 minutes talk, but um, I can't uh, cover all of these things. And what I want to talk about, and let's see uh, about the times, uh, like what, uh, what I want to spend more and less time on, is uh, first I want to introduce, uh, give a, well, give some introduction, like what, what, is the, what, what is the inverse problem I'm interested in? What are these diagrams? So I, uh, they will be abbreviated, some of them GBPD. Uh, we'll come to that later. And um, I want to talk a little bit about what are good parameters here. So that is this optimal in my title. Um, there are several things one can ask. Um, yeah, what are good parameters in that sense? And there is a relationship to Bayes classifiers. I'm not completely sure, it depends on the audience, um, how much I, uh, well, how much I will go into details there. So it's about um, Bayes classifiers, which is used in machine learning. So there are some interpretations uh, and connections here. And I want to talk a little bit about the optimization problem, uh, like finding not only good parameters, but even the best parameters or optimal parameters. And well, and there's also an algorithm we, we <laughs> came up with uh, about support vector machines. Was there a question? No, it was just, uh, sorry, the microphone. Um, and then I want to, well, and, and then I could mention a little bit of some of the super pixel things that there are even related uh, related applications, but, uh, but not really related to material science. Um, so, yeah. The um, the thing I want to talk about is, um, so, yeah. so, um, so I, I got interested in, in tomographic imaging usually um, of polycrystals and polycrystals, these are metals, ceramics, um, uh, alloys, uh, rocks. Uh, so polycrystal means like if you look at such a metal here, maybe aluminum, then inside it looks like this. Um, so on the nano level, so these colors are not representing atoms. These are still, these are small crystals, so to speak. So you don't see the atoms, but all of these atoms inside, they are arranged 
in a certain direction. Well, they are arranged in a lattice. And that's what, uh, Vitaly, you are talking about uh, most of the time of, of how does this lattice look like? Yes, I understand. <laughs> and um, I'm also interested in these lattices. I mean, so and material scientists are interested in how does the lattice inside look like? Uh, I mean, what's the orientation? Um, but um, but also the shape here. So these are small crystals. They are not infinite in size. Um, they have uh, well, yeah, they have a certain shape. And um, and then probably several in the audience know this better than me. They um, cracks uh, appear along usually along grain boundaries. If you heat heat up this material, some of these grains grow. Some of them shrink. Um, well and. Uh, um, and one wants to understand what is going on inside inside such a material. And what I've been doing with the collaborators from the Technical University of Denmark, well, already since several years, many years, uh, is um, they are taking such a, a sample to the ESRF, the Euro European uh, Radiation uh, Synchrotron Radiation Facility in Grenoble. Um, and there, in such a here, such an uh, accelerator, they they place the specimen. They have high energy X rays, and these high energy X rays can be used to look into this material. And tomography means like you are doing this from many different angles, and then you observe some images which look like this. This is a diffraction image. Um, so you are recording these spots here. They are diffraction spots, so to speak. They are, um, I mean, this this thing here, for instance, uh, do you see my mouse? Yes. Uh, um, um, this small thing comes from one grain. Uh, it's so mathematically speaking, it's a projection of, I don't know of what grain, but it is, uh, you get some information from different angle. You get these spots and then the tomographic reconstruction problem would be, can you reconstruct from this data here, from these spots, can you reconstruct the shapes of these grains? Or, and can you infer some information about the lattice structure? I mean, what is the orientation and so on? And this here is not a grain. This is just the beam stop because on the detector, I mean, these are high energy X-rays. Most of the energy goes through the central, I mean, um, is not absorbed. And so if you don't cut this here out, here's a lead um, protection or something like that. If you're not cutting this out, your detector is usually burning here. Um, so they, that was the original problem or is it one of the main problems the material scientists I'm working with are interested in. So from the experimental point of view, taking a specimen, recording these images and then reconstructing what is going on. And, um, well, and you can do this in many different levels and, and resolutions and so on. And there are many different problems involved here. So there is one called indexing. That's usually the problem where you would say you need to sort which of these spots are belonging to the same grain. I mean, if you are, if you are able to do this, if you really sort this and, and you see like, okay, from these and these angles, I have seen here this and this grain then you can use this information and do a tomographic reconstruction, like, like uh, reconstructing a brain in medical imaging. You have many, many angles and you record, and, and from these many angles, you are reconstructing the brain structure or something like this. The problem here is indexing, first of all, that you need to find like which spots correspond to the same grain. That's already non-trivial. And even if you are um, successful, um, then usually you just have um, information from 10 angles or something like this. So it's not that you acquire information from 200 angles. I mean, you, you do the experiment from 200 uh, angles or, or these steps, but the diffraction conditions are usually not met. And so you often just yeah measure like 10, 10 angles or something like this. And that was also the main point why material scientists contacted us because I was working on discrete tomography. So tomography questions where you don't have so much data. And, uh, and here it is the case, you don't have much data. So you just acquire this from a few angles. But on the other hand, you are not interested in how the inner structure looks like. So it's more like a homogeneous object. So you, you are just interested, what's the shape of this object? And you, and they are, 
often not too complicated. At least they are homogeneous. So in that sense, it's an easier problem than in medical imaging, that the object is easier, but, uh, but it's more complicated because you have uh, less information. Yeah, so and then there's a reconstruction problem, reconstructing these things and, and what people, this is a slice, and usually lots of problems turn up in these boundary areas. I mean, so this is now here depicted in white, white color. I mean, you are usually really interested where is the boundary and that's exactly where the standard algorithms, tomographic algorithms are not useful because you are not having enough data from 10 directions, you will end up with very fuzzy images. And so that's that's more or less the origin, like why I got interested in these kind of things. And um, but I want to talk about these, yeah, generalized balance power diagrams. That's the sort of geometric diagram. So here you see an image, which is a, just a micros um, microscopy image, two dimensional microscopy image. And here these cells are uh, these grains, these small crystals. Here's one small crystal, here's one small crystal, here's one and so on. And so in, in black, you just see the boundaries. Of course, I mean, that would be ideal if you could reconstruct this from these diffraction images. But this image, what I showed you show you here is not a reconstruction, that's really the surface. People with an electron microscope looked at the surface and made this picture. That's a very, I mean, it takes a long time and uh, PhD students, I was told, are really, were really doing this, like looking at the surface and then they are polishing the, the surface. So to look at the next layer, make another image and so on. And so that, that would be a 3D method of acquiring such information. But I mean, always surface by surface, but, uh, but that takes, takes a long time, several years, usually for such a specimen, a whole PhD. Um, and well, anyway, so this is a surface and this looks quite regular. We are, I mean, of course, I mean, well, we should be interested in, in all the fine details, but if you look at this from a broader perspective, it looks quite regular. And what we did, uh, well, initially in 2015, um, was that we looked at these, um, we modeled these, um, these cells uh, by some geometric diagrams, which will I which I will explain on the next slides, and the thing what we compute is, for instance, this blue thing here. So I mean, the blue boundaries are the ones we are saying should be the ones in our mathematical model. Our mathematical model gives the blue boundaries, and you see it's quite a good fit. I think f around ninety five percent of the pixels are correctly in the right in the right cell. But you see also here some some things are, well, there is a mismatch. I mean, it's not perfect, um, but the main point is um, the blue thing is the mathematical model. And that's the perfect model, so to speak. I mean, mathematics uh, from a mathematics uh, formulation. And black is reality and probably deviating here a bit from that, um, well, from, from the mathematical description or how, well, however one wants to phrase that. And here's another structure. Yeah, Vitaly? Yeah, Andres, could, could, could I ask um, yes. the blue regions on, on the previous slide, <clears throat> uh, are they all convex? Um, in this, uh, no. No, no. Are, they, are they here? Are they here convex? I mean, they don't need to be convex. So here in that example, um, this is um, black regions are certainly not convex. Yes, yes. Um, well, I don't see anything non convex here when I look at this, but mathematically speaking, and I will come to this in a, in a second, no, they don't need okay. to be convex anymore. I mean, there are, uh, uh, well, uh, there are several. Uh, several generalizations of what kind of diagrams I'm looking at. But in the most general form, these are the general, the GBPDs, the generalized balance power diagrams. And here the cells don't need to be convex. I mean, so one can model non-convex situations. And the boundaries also look here quite linear. 
um, that's also not the case. In these GBPDs, the boundaries can be described by quadratic equations. So they can be quadratic, not arbitrarily, like, like not cubic or, I mean, so they cannot follow much, but quadratic. Let me show you this one here. I mean, here is a real image again. And what I what we have here as, as a fit, here you see really something non-convex, for instance, right? I mean, if you look at this kind of thing. So, um, but I mean, the, these, these boundaries, this one here is described by quadratic curve. This one is quadratic, this one. So the boundaries to the neighboring um, grains, they are not linear anymore, but they are quadratic. Um, yeah, and, oh, and I also should mention, um, even in that framework, cells might be even, could be even disconnected. So mathematically speaking, um, one could have such cells which are disconnected, and that's probably something you don't have in reality. I mean, here in reality, we don't have disconnected cells, but it's quite, um, and it's quite surprising if we use real data and compute our diagrams, we always get this good fits and non, uh, and um, and the cells will always be connected. But mathematically speaking, this is still something which surprises us. Yes, Mite? Could I also ask about cells with holes inside? So ring-like structures, are they possible? Yes, yes. You, 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 can, have a, you, you can have a cell um, and, and there's another one outside, yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting, okay. So it's indeed a, a wide variety. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so maybe maybe just just briefly mention this here. So I think that because that's quite important. Uh, I mean, so um, there are several types of diagrams around, and these generalized balanced power diagrams they are a special type of anisotropic power diagrams. And anisotropic means, well, you are you are just um, you are computing a dissection of space. I mean, so you are partition the plane, for instance. I mean, here is a here you see um, well, you see here how many cells, like uh, five cells, and so you are partitioning here the plane into say five cells. And how do you do this? You have a point here in black. That's my SI. So you have a seed point, uh, and you are measuring what are the points closest to this seed point um, with respect to a certain norm or with respect to a certain distance measure here. So you're computing um, the distance uh, of these um, to SI and everything which is closest to this one will be in that uh, in that pink cell. Everything which is closest to this blue one will be in this, in this blue cell. Everything which is closest to the gray one will be in this cell. And the thing which is quite general for an isotropic power diagrams is, well, power means you take the Euclidean norm squared. That's not a big, that's not a big deal here. You can take to the three, four, and so on if you want. But we take here the, well, second power. It's also a good thing that you don't have square roots anymore and so on. Um, but there are two things in here. There is a norm. So there is an ellipsoidal norm, which means... Um, Usually you would take the Euclidean norm. So you measure everything isotropically. You, you take a, the, you, your unit ball is really a ball. Everything which is distance one is really a distance one away from that center. But this uh, ellipsoidal norm is doing, is stretching this kind of thing. So you, instead, uh, instead of having a, a circle of radius one, you have an ellipsoid here. And you say like this point here has a distance one to the center, but also this point here has distance one to the center. So you are, um, you are accounting for the fact that some of your cells are elongated in certain directions. So that's the unisotropic thing. So you can, if you want, if you take the identity matrix, then you are in that kind of case, uh, but you can take here other positive, uh, semi-definite, well, positive definite matrices, and that will define ellipsoids, and you measure these with respect to these ellipsoids. You can do this even more general. I mean, but I'm not to go into these details here. So, uh, yes. Uh, Andreas, uh, have I understood correctly? AI are matrices D by D, and yes, why are considered as parameters here? Uh, wait a second. I didn't say anything about parameters yet. Well, um, but, but you are. But you choose. Uh, you choose one, right? Um, 
Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. It's a good question, which I wanted to answer a bit later. Um, <laughs> so, so suppose for the moment these AI are given. I mean, so you are you know how to measure that this grain. Uh, is represented. I mean, for such a grain, you are measuring more. I mean, th in this direction, things can be further away than here, and so on. Let's say these AI will be uh, are given. They will be later parameters. But let's say ellipsoids are given, and mm -hmm. say the SI are given. So these black points, if if these things are given, and say here's also an additive parameter. You can even have something like. Uh, well, you can adjust the distance by subtracting 10 or something for grain 10 or something like, or for grain five. So, so suppose, so suppose AI and mu I and SI, I should make this in red. Suppose they are given these three things, then your unisotropic power diagram, you can compute it. You are just computing which points are closest uh, with respect uh, to this norm. That will be your IF cell. Um, and the, the, of course, the, uh, a good question is like, okay, how do I get these? I mean, how do I get AI? How do I get mu I? Uh, what are, and yes. So that's something I want to do on, on some of the next slides. Um, but suppose if they are given, then you can compute such a diagram. And that's also what you are, well, I, I listened to one of your talks where you are where computing some of these Voronoi uh, diagrams um, in, in some way. I mean, there you, assume that, well, I mean, I, I come to this in a second, uh, but but there these things are given, right? Yes, yes, sure. Thank you. Yeah, so the anisotropic power diagrams are quite general. I mean, if this is identity matrix, then one would call them power diagrams. Um, and even if uh, this additive term here is vanishing, then these things are the Voronoi diagrams. So. Uh, anisotropic are more general, uh, well, uh, include the Voronoi diagrams, the power diagrams, and anisotropic di uh, power diagrams. And the GBPDs are even a bit more on top, well, as, no, they are not in, on top of this. The GBPDs are anisotropic power diagrams, which I compute in a, in a special way, such that they have several properties. So GBPDs are in the class of anisotropic power diagrams, but including power diagrams and including Voronoi diagrams. Here's, a, here's an anisotropic power diagram uh, thing. You can imagine, for instance, that things are growing from, from a certain seed points, and then you get these boundaries. So here you see really clearly quadratic boundaries. And if you take a power diagram, then uh, so there you don't have an ellipsoidal norm your growth is isotropic in each case, then you get such a power diagram. Here, the boundaries would be linear. And here would be convex, linear, convex, connected. Here, well, here you see a not, connect, a not convex, but could be even disconnected. And here, Voronoi diagram uh, looks very similar to that one, but you have more freedom with power diagrams with this, with this parameter. Um, some well, so some com well. Um, I don't uh, want to go into the details. I mean, how to compute these generalized balance power diagrams. All I want to mention is that um, we we do this by linear optimization. Um, but the linear program, so the linear, so one can compute. Uh, yeah, with a linear optimization software or posing this as a linear optimization problem, one can compute these generalized balance power diagrams. And that's what we did in, in 2015 paper. But the point is the number of variables, don't, I, I don't want to go into the details. The number of variables is very large and too large usually to have 3D computations. So we can do this for 2D images. And that's what we did uh, 2015. Um, but 3D images were out of reach. I, I mean, because you need to compute uh, the linear optimization problem involves a lot of variables, like several uh, hundreds of millions, uh, 10 to the 10 to the eight variables or something like that. Um, and that's, but they are a very good fit. I mean, so that that's what we had in 2015, and and, and other researchers confirmed this and, and we're also, uh, I mean, in the material science literature and then we're using these generalized balance power diagrams, but because they are so computationally 
um, well, you need a lot of computation power. Um, several researchers um, propose different ways of um, of computing things. I mean, so we compute the generalized balanced power diagrams. That meant uh, in our original setting, we were computing the mu i. That is the optimal. Well, Vitaly, what you were asking about the the parameters. Um, so we have an, we so what we propose is compute well take as SI just the center of masses if if you have such an image or if you have tomography data center of masses are are the SI the AI just estimate them as as good fitting ellipsoids say by a principal component analysis and then compute the mu I the last set of parameters which is still there compute this by a linear program. And then you and then you have your diagram. You, then you have all parameters, and but that is still a, such a big linear optimization problem. And other researchers were then saying, well, let's uh, because that's computationally too expensive. Let's do something else. Let's just um, well, for some said like let's just set all the mu i to zero. And I have this on the other slide. There are some other direct settings, so they they don't involve any optimization at all. And of course, that's fast. And um, and the fit was often surprisingly good. Um, not, um, I mean, when we optimize over the MUI, we get a better fit, as I said, like ninety-seven percent or something like that. But people reported that they get still a fit of uh, of ninety-five percent of the pixels or ninety-two percent, but still ninety percent of the pixels, if they were not optimizing at all here. And that was quite surprising. And we were also asking us, uh, is this always the case? I mean. This was reported here for real data. Um, and of course, the question comes up, can you actually optimize over all parameters? I mean, can you optimize, can you find the best SI, AI, and um, UI at the same time? And there has been an algorithm from the, in 2016, in Monte Carlo, so, well, more or less a stochastic optimization. Um, and it takes, I mean, for some data set, it took um, several days of computing things like this. It's very slow, but of course you can make this parallel if you want. Um, and there is another algorithm. We came up with an algorithm and there's another algorithm, uh, which if you compute really for three dimensional data with a thousand grains, computation times on a normal laptop are were with this approach around 17 hours hours was about 10 hours but still in the same order um, so there are you can compute now things um, optimizing over all parameters uh, not real time not really quick but if you want to have high um, quality images um, I mean, on, in some high resolution, maybe you want to spend such a time sometimes on some of the reconstructions. Um, yeah, and why uh, why is this possible? Um, I mean, I said we had this linear optimization approach 2015. The point is that we, um, we were able now to show that in the linear program, we don't need all the variables, so to speak. So we can, um, we can compute on a lower resolution that uh, the diagram. So involving 0.1% uh, uh, of the pixels. So reducing uh, the variables by a factor of 1000 or something like that. Um, that this, um, I mean, um, that this is not giving the optimal result, of course. I mean, but it gives you, I mean, we have mathematical results which say, um, if you want to have an epsilon approximation, so to speak, so if you want to be as close, you give me the epsilon, how close you want to be, then we have mathematical results which say like, okay, you just need to have this many pixels, um, not all. And that reduces here the, the variable space quite a lot um, and, and makes these three-dimensional computations possible. Um, well, maybe just quickly this the, these good per, per diagram parameters, because I think that's too technical um, if I go much into the details. But just to give you the general picture here, I mean, um, well, so these were the GBPD cells. So I mentioned already that P 
people here in 2015, they said, set everything to zero. That's a good thing. And there were others in, in 2018, which said like, it's more like a more complicated formula of setting the mu i. But if one looks into this formula, it says something, this uh, new i is the volume of the cell in your, I mean, say you have an electron microscopy image, then you can see what's the volume of that cell. That's the volume of that cell. And you divide the volume of that cell with the volume of the unit ball, so to speak. So, so they are just saying like, okay, large volume is getting a large mu i. Let, let's forget about the minus for a second or something. But but so it's it's like proportionally to the volume you do something with the mu i. And that that makes sense intuitively because I mean setting everything to zero just means like okay, I don't care about this uh, additive uh, parameter. Setting everything like uh, uh, proportional to that volume, this correction term is here just to do this in d dimensions. Um, Doing this proportionally is intuitively not a bad thing because you would say, okay, a large grain, I mean, then everything I want to enhance the area of that of that grain if I give it a large mu i. So I'm subtracting a, 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 a very negative mu i. That means like I have a larger region where there is an influence of this uh, of that grain. But on the other hand, it's difficult. I mean, that, that's the intuition behind it, but still it's difficult to control really in this way the power diagram. I mean, intuitively speaking, it's correct to, if you want to have a large grain, make, make mu i large, but, but that has an impact on others and so on. So keeping the balance here is, is, is usually complicated. That's why we do the optimization. But people showed for some real data sets, well, if you're just setting this uh, as a heuristic, that's also giving you quite good results. And the question is, why are these kind of things actually good? Uh, or that is, was at least the question we we had when we we saw these papers. And um, and well, we didn't really know. And um, maybe in terms of time, yeah, maybe. Uh, um, yeah, just let me just give you the general picture. Uh, like what what kind of uh, answer we have to this? Like why why are these direct settings sometimes a good thing? Um, we are not really um, yeah. So we have a mathematical explanation, <laughs> um, and one for instance comes from that uh, point of view. If some of you know Bayes classifiers, that means like where you have some data points. Say they are all black. And you want to cluster them into two clusters. Say you want to find automatically uh, here is a uh, here these should be red and these should be blue as well. You you automatically want to find two clusters, and there are many different ways of doing that. And one uh, particular way is yeah is is Bayes classifiers where you are assuming certain um, stochastic properties of your data points. Um, so you could you want to find the boundaries, so to speak, between these things. I mean, so suppose you you know that these are already red and these are already blue, and then you have a new point and you want to classify: does it belong to that class or the other class? Does that pixel belong to that grain or the other grain? And if you have computed the boundary, the decision line, the decision boundary between between these two sets of data points. Then you just look, is it on the right or left? And then you assign it, okay, it's here on that side. So it should be a red point. That's uh, that's what a Bayes classifier is usually doing. So the Bayes classifier file is, is while well, you are computing that decision boundary, once you have that boundary, you can classify each new point. But how do you compute that boundary? That's where some stochastic, um, well, some stoch uh, assumptions come in. And with Bayes classifiers, let me just skip that support vector machine thing. I mean, the the Bayes classifier would just say, suppose all your data points, these red and blue points. I mean, they are they are samples of a random variable. So you have uh, you have a coordinate of a point. That's your x. That's your location. Where is the point? And why is the label? Should it be red or blue? I mean, label means here in the context of grains, also the color of the grain or the label of the grain. Is this grain one or is it grain 10 or whatever? And so you can think of this, if you think about this in a random way, you can say like, okay, I have several points uh, in space. They are maybe my pixels in my computer image. These are the locations of the pixels. 
and I want to assign a color. I want to say like, okay, is it red or is it blue or whatever? And Bayes classifier would just say, okay, let's just look at one of these points. So I know it is already at this location. What is now the most likely color in my stochastic model explaining, I mean, explaining the color. I mean, so what, uh, I have several colors uh, at my disposal. Um, so, so I can have uh, red or blue or something like that. And I just need to calculate, okay, what are the properties given that I'm at that location? What's the probability that it is red or is blue? And if the probability for blue is larger, then I say, okay, that point should be blue. Um, and in this model, you have two ingredients usually. I mean, you have a prior that's more or less, um, I mean, this gives you the probability if you're just asking what's the probability that a point is blue, no matter what the location is. So you would say if you have an electron microscopy image of two grains, a red and a blue one, and you see that blue occupies 80% of your image, you would say, okay, that probability is 80%. Um, and uh, without looking at the location, you would say in 80% of the cases, I think that's red. In uh, 20% of the cases, you would say it's blue. So, so you might have this prior information available. Um, this comes goes in, and you have you have a probability um, you have a well a probability density function available, which says like, okay, um, suppose I know that I'm talking about red points, what is then the, uh, like how, how are the locations now distributed? And with Bayes classifiers, you would say, okay, they are all normally distributed about, uh, around an SL. Um, so that would be the Gaussian assumption. You suppose, so you say like, okay, um, I know the SL, I know the seeds, but, um, but from a probability point of view, I know that all the points are around SL, but with a Gaussian distribution. So further away, less likely and so on. And there are some factors coming in, but that's, I mean, and, uh, and the Gaussian distribution here is, can be anisotropic because you have these ellipsoids and so on. Um, yeah, the Bayes classifier, uh, Bayes theorem just says like, okay, you just need to multiply these two things and then compute the maximum. And that's the, the color you give to that point. Um, so let me skip that. Um, you can work out in this, in this kind of context, um, you can work out how the decision boundaries look like for these Gaussian, um, well, for these uh, Bayes classifiers. And it turns out that you come to an equation where you are saying, okay, the points on the boundaries, they are fulfilling this kind of equation. And here you see, this is exactly the term you usually have in a diagram. This is on the other side of the diagram, but you usually have a mu and here you have a mu. And so if you want to have it in that form that you can interpret this as a diagram, you are just having, okay, this must be, this term must be the mu and this term must be the mu. And let's, if you do the computation, of checking what that means, you come to the uh, conclusion that in the case where people said like setting everything or the mu to zero, when they said that this is a good thing, you can interpret this as they were saying the prior, so the, the probability that something is red is proportional to this term. And I just translated in a, here in this one, it actually means it, it is proportional to the volume of the ELF ellipsoid. So um, let me see this. And it actually means, so if mu, if all these are set to zero, and if this is a good fit, you are in the situation that, um, that the ellipsoid, you are computing an ellipsoid for your grain all the time. Um, and that has a certain volume. The ellipsoid has this kind of volume. And if this volume here of that ellipsoid is a good approximation in terms of volume to your grain, that, so if the ellipsoid volume represents the grain volumes well, then these mu setting all of them to zero, um, I mean, is a good thing. I mean, because uh, that's exactly how you would do the, classif uh, the, the classifier. Um, if you would say, okay, grains are, there is a seed point and everything around it is Gaussian distributed. Um, if, if these ellipsoids, these AI, which you have as input, if they are a good 
approximation to these volumes, then this is a good method. So here you, one can say like, we are having a packing with ellipsoids. And if these ellipsoids are really representing more or less the diagram structure volume wise in a very good way, then setting everything to zero is a good thing. I mean, or is sufficient. And you can interpret the other things as well, but uh, which I don't want to do here. But what you can see is, well, being mathematicians, we are asking, well, okay, in reality, both things are pretty well, pretty good things, but in theory, there must be a difference. Um, so are there any, any yeah, are there differences? And say, well, this doesn't look really like a grain. Here's a blue grain and an and a, and a orange grain, two grains. Uh, and if you approximate them with an ellipsoid, well, this is your PCA uh, principal component ellipsoid. This is the one here also for that. So you would compute these ellipsoids and then you would do a reconstruction. And, and if, you would do the, uh, if you take this example and you grow this grain here, always in this mathematic, very simple way, then here again, your ellipsoid approximating the orange one is always a circle, is growing, uh, but the other one, the blue one, I mean, gets more and more awful. I mean, approximating here this blue structure, you get such an ellipsoid. And let's say we are now computing the unisotropic power diagram with setting everything to zero and setting everything to this kind of volume thing, what others proposed. Are there any differences? Well, not for these two, first two cases. You compute more or less the same kind of um, grains. But in the more extreme case, you really get here such a such a um, situation where really things are disconnected. Here is something in orange. Here is something in orange for that one setting. While the other setting, where you set everything to zero, you get this kind of grain and this kind of grain. And this is a good approximation in a certain sense to, to that kind of image. I mean, you can't do better because we are not doing linear, piecewise linear or anything. Um, I mean, this is in some sense a good approximation to that awful situation. But in terms of volume, this is bad. This is a better thing, an approximation with volume. So anyway, all I wanted to say is um, one can prove that there are, on, on real data, it seems like, okay, many times these two heuristics are very similar. But you can prove, of course, I mean, there are situations where things are getting worse and and and, and they are completely different the solutions you are getting well completely you might say is maybe not completely different but uh, you can go to these extreme cases um let me maybe just um yeah so, so maybe just one slide about the parameter optimization thing i'm, I'm skipping these kind of things um well optimizing ai mu i and si they will be parameters. And I told you, if SI is not a parameter, AI is not a parameter, only mu i, then we have already large linear programs to solve, large linear optimization problems. Um, we can now solve them because we don't need all these variables. So that brought us to the point where we said, OK, let's try now optimizing over, ma making the space again larger um, and see like what still what can we optimize. On the other hand, it looks like a very, um, like a very nonlinear problem, like because if you if you're multiplying all these kind of things, you see like if SI is a variable, here AI things are a variable, here SI SI, so you see here is quadratic or even AI is in there, um, well highly nonlinear, and I don't want to go into the details here, what, what we do, like, um, but what we end up is something similar, like a support vector machine approach with a soft margin classifier, where you say, okay, probably I can't compute exactly the boundary, or at least uh, not every pixel is completely fitting into, into these cells. There might be a small error. And the soft margin, so to speak, for the experts here, some of them in the audience maybe. Um, but we want to minimize that kind of error. So we are we want to find a diagram such that every point is fitting, so to speak, into that framework, 
but if it is not fitting, we want to minimize, so to speak, the the deviation in a certain way. It's not the pixel difference what we are optimizing, uh, but it is something like we are minimizing a misclassification error in a, in a certain way, like uh, like in support vector machines. And the main point, and then the main main trick is, if you look at all these variables here, um, all these variables one can encode them in higher dimensional space. So these, these are all variables, these are all variables and so on. So you can put them all into a very long data vector in higher dimensional space. Um, and that makes it a linear problem in higher dimensional space. And um, in, in, in the way we did this, I mean, yeah, uh, well, there are some technicalities of course um, um, with this, um, but, um, doing this in higher dimensions, you have a linear problem. Um, but again, still making the, the 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 number of variables even larger. Right? I mean, so um, yeah. So here I don't go into these details. So and and not these remarks. But let me just show you. Um, I mean, so so what we do here is really say. It's a it's a real data set, 339 slices, uh, no, 599 slices of 339 times 339 images. So you have a lot of pixels. If we reduce them to 0.1%, that's what we showed you can do. So you, you just take these uh, 68 uh, million points. You have these many grains. Um, then you can still fit all the parameters. How, how long does it take? Well, around 10 hours on a normal, but on a normal computer. Um, if, you, um, if you do the approach I said before for the whole data set of these points and so on, I mean, not optimizing all parameters, just optimizing a UI, well, you are here around uh, 2.6 minutes. So that, that, that's pretty fast. But is this a good thing, optimizing over all parameters? Well, you can say, there are several measures of, of how, how good is your, your diagram, but say how many pixels are correct. Here you get 95% of the pixels are correct if you optimize over everything. But if you just optimize over the MUI, you get 93%, right? So that's not bad. So that's, I mean, for the real data set, and that's what people observe for these real data sets to get into the 90s range or something, you can do this with these diagrams rather quickly, you don't need to find the best parameter, uh, the best diagram, so to speak. Um, and then maybe just three more minutes on the, on, on, but I mean, so, so I, I just talked about the diagrams and, and we are interested in computing them. I didn't say actually why, um, why am I interested in computing these? And there, well, I should have included probably a slide. So, I mean, one, one point is, well, the tomographic reconstruction I mentioned at the very beginning. I mean, getting the center of masses, uh, getting estimations of the AI and so on, these are parameters. Experimentalists say they can get it from tomography images, from the data. So in a sense, this is a reconstruction algorithm. You get uh, you get from these measurements these parameters, and then you just compute the diagram. That's that's one thing. Of course, it's not a yeah. I mean, usually it's just an initial solution, and you want to refine it later or something like that. Another uh, application why I'm doing this is you are representing your whole image just by a few parameters. You just need to store the SI, AI, and MUI, and you don't need to store every pixel. So in terms of data compression, so it's not, maybe not too amaz amazing, but um, but if you want to do simulations on such a structure, so you are you are having you you model now your structure just with these few parameters, and then you do some uh, material simulations. So you want to say, okay, one of these volumes grow gets bigger, one of this gets larger, and so on. It's much easier to do the computations, at least computationally, on that level of these parameters than I mean, of course there are simulations where you do this on the pixel level. But I mean, the advantage, what I'm proposing here with these uh, with these diagrams is if you do this on this diagram level, you have different advantages. Um, I mean, there are also, of course, disadvantages because you will lose accuracy, but there are several advantages. 
because you are just having a fewer parameters, still a good fit, and you have geometric descriptions of the boundary, you have um, quadratic uh, equations for the boundaries and so on. And one thing what we did is, uh, while taking that idea just to a different application um, called super pixels, like if you have such an image here, um, your pixels are usually the square pixels, the, the normal pixels you have, but people have looked at, well, 2003, at small non-overlapping groups of connected perceptually homogeneous pixels. So probably, so people wanted to look at, can I group these pixels still into small groups, but la I mean, but group them into small groups and these should be easily computable, but they should be then the basis of further algorithms. So if you want to segment the image, if you want to find that flower in that image, I mean, maybe a good thing is to compute this these cells here very quickly in, in, in yellow. And if you have these cells very quickly, then perform some image segmentation algorithm on these super pixels. So these cells would be called super pixels. So you would say, oh, that, that's all red. That should be that uh, in the object. This is all red, all in the object and so on. You lose, of course, accuracy here, for instance. I mean, there's part of the object and the large part not of the object in there. And you can treat this only as, I mean, as one super pixel. So you're just saying, you just need to say, is it now your object or not? Um, so you see, if you want to have super pixels as a very fast way of comp for, 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 for later image processing, you want to have them to adhere to boundaries. They should be pretty good at uh, yeah, adhering to boundaries, but they should be also easy to compute. I mean, so you, you should be able to compute this in a very fast way. Otherwise, all your downstream tasks are, I mean, um, are very slow. Um, so they should adhere to the boundaries. And what people also want to have is compact shape. That's usually what, what people say, like, when, what does that mean? So they, the boundary shouldn't be complicated. I mean, there's an algorithm, also many people say a good one. I mean, uh, it adheres here very good to boundaries, um, but the boundaries of the uh, pixels themselves are quite complicated, complicated to store, um, well, it depends, I mean, what you want to do with this. Um, there are uh, several new algorithms where they say, like, we want to do this, uh, well, in a geometric way, so easily describable boundaries. Um, and um, if you look at this here, for instance, of course, th this part here, I mean, is not adhering well to boundaries. I mean, but what, what we do is if we uh, apply more or less the same algorithm um, as for the GBPDs um, in a way to these computer images, we get these anisotropic power diagrams. So quadratic boundaries. So you see here something round and here you see something round. So quadratic boundaries. Um, so you get these kind of super pixels. I mean, the advantage is you have descriptions of the boundaries as equations. So they are really quadratic boundaries. Um, you can control to some extent, like um, how how large these super pixels should be, the maximum size, and some and so on. I mean, of course, here is something very small in here, but this is just a small pixel with here something green. Um, yeah, so so we applied this kind of thing, and the whole idea, well, just just as a as a almost last slide is, you take that image. You take a standard algorithm which computes some super pixel things here, and then on top of this standard algorithm, which should perform this very quickly, you are then computing. Um, I mean, these are you interpret these as cells, brain cells, so to speak. This is your microscopy image, and now we say, okay, let's compute for every of these pixel, uh, every of these cells, an anisotropic. Uh, well, you compute the PCA, you compute this ellipsoid, and you compute the center of mass, and then you compute that diagram, and that's what you get here, and that's the tessellation. That's a super pixel um, partition that we are proposing. Um, yeah. So I, I don't want to go into details. Like, I mean, we are better with boundaries than newer algorithms, which want to have a nice boundary. Uh, so there we are with black, we are better than these geometric methods and they are quite new. Um, we are not beating 
even older ones, which, I mean, these fuzzy things, for instance, which follow very nicely boundaries, we are not able to, uh, to, to capture all, all these boundaries, of course, because we have constraints that our boundaries should be quadratic, but we are better than these previous ones, they, which are new ones, which have linear boundaries. Um, we are a little bit, bit less compact. So ours are, of course, uh, I mean, compactness means like, they were quite regular, the ones I showed you before, because they had linear boundaries, we have quadratic ones. But we are in that group of very compact things. The ones which follow really nicely these boundaries, they are here in this area of having very low compactness and, and so on. So there are advantages and disadvantages. Um, and that's, of course, always debatable. I mean, our algorithm, I mean, computes things here like uh, in milliseconds where other things take 30 minutes or 28 uh, seconds, 28 seconds, uh, not 30 minutes, 30 seconds, <laughs> 28 seconds. And in, in some sense, what, what we are doing here is bridging a little bit the gap between pixel methods, which are producing super pixels, but quite fuzzy boundaries. We are producing things which have geometric boundaries, so good descriptions. Um, these were really slow. Uh, as you see here, the 2001 paper, and here even even that here, 194 seconds, and we are still in the in the uh, with milliseconds on, on the, in that area. Um, so with this, I want to close and just want to say like so these uh, bound uh, generalized balanced power diagrams. So these are geometric diagrams, and they are useful to model grain structures uh, in material science. Um, and this is all ongoing research. So we are now able to compute these kind of things for three dimensional data sets and also dynamic data sets. Optimization over all parameters is possible. If you want to do that, that's a different question because I, I think you saw, saw in that talk, yeah, I mean, you are not winning much usually, but you can do that. Um, and GBPDs are also starting to be useful in other contexts. I mean, not only in material science. With this, I want to talk uh, or stop. And thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm I'm very happy to answer. Thank you very much, Andras. Let us thank Andras, please. <clears throat> yes, physically, virtually. And now I'll stop uh, the recording. <clears throat>